Hey everyone, welcome back to the Hardware News Recap for the week. In this one, we'll be talking about PC World's YouTube channel disappearing. Also, AMD has a new product to announce, gaming chairs. AMD has collaborated with Vertigear to bring out a, oh man, it's more than I thought, $580 gaming chair. But don't worry, it's black, red, and it says AMD on it. So you'll get your value one way or the other. Uh, additionally, there's rumors about NVIDIA's many, many hundreds of watts of video card and allegedly 48 gigabytes of memory on it. Uh, what is this thing? AD102 450A1. We'll be talking about that and the legitimacy of these claims. Uh, leaks about Ryzen 7000 SKUs. We'll be going over some news as well. AMD has a really cool utility that can inspect scenes to help developers optimize for ray tracing. So that's kind of cool to talk about and a couple of other things. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermal Grizzly. Thermal Grizzly's Hydronaut and Cryonaut thermal pastes are high-performing thermal interfaces for use on CPUs and GPUs. You can bring an old card back to peak performance by repasting it and doing preventative maintenance, and Thermal Grizzly's Hydronaut is ideal for water cooling and air cooling for new and old cards alike. Cryonaut paste is one of the top performing pastes for extreme overclocking with CPUs and GPUs, and has been used in several world record scoring machines. Learn more at the link in the description below. All right, so first up, PC World's channel disappeared. PC World, uh, one of the people who works there is Gordon Ma'an. He's a friend of ours at GN. He's been in many of our videos, and he's, he's ridiculous in a good way. Gordon, uh, if you ever read the Maximum PC magazines or other older magazines that were... Ooh, that sounds... Gordon, I'm not calling you old. If you read magazines that were on shelves back in the day, you likely read Gordon's articles or letters from the editor uh, for computer building and PC uh, and tech magazines. So he's been in the industry, he's done really good work and we love working with him. Now these days he's at PC World and unfortunately he had to email us because of an issue with their YouTube channel. And the issue was the channel's gone. Kind of a big issue in terms of issue rank for people who make at least part of their, their money in PC World's case off of YouTube kind of up towards the top. So here's what happened. Gordon reached out to us knowing that we were recently age-gated on one of our videos, which cost us somewhere around two-thirds or a little over, basically most of the revenue for that video during the period it was age-gated. He emailed us thinking, surely these guys have a contact who can help them? And the answer is, nope. No, no one helped us. Uh, one of our YouTube viewers helped us, not a YouTube employee. Anyway, I forwarded Gordon over to uh, some staff at YouTube who, I mean, I don't know. You know, it's the, it's the most I can do. I don't think anything's going to come of it. I think he's going to get what he needs, but it's going to be through some weird, it'll be maybe from this. Maybe one of you in the audience who works at Google can paint the right people. But here's what happened. Uh, PC World is owned by a large media conglomerate and it's a big company, the, the, at least the overarching parent company, whatever owns it. And so it's a more traditional media outlet in that regard. They have a website, they have the YouTube channel, and then they have these other media properties and people who work within that company to manage things. This is where the problems happen. Uh, one of the groups within that media conglomerate is IT. And IT, apparently, from what we understand, thought it would be an excellent idea to consolidate email accounts including the one that is used to access YouTube. Generally, so that you might notice that there's a space between Gamers and Nexus in the channel name. Technically, the name is Gamers Nexus one word, capital G, capital N. That's how we stylize it. That's the formatting for the company name on every other uh, platform that we use. The reason it has the space still on YouTube is because I am terrified of changing that name because I don't know what YouTube will do, how it will react. It's like, it's like uh, antibodies reacting to a virus, except the virus is any kind of change whatsoever, and the reaction is it kills you. So that's why I've left the space there. And the same thing goes with email, where you really got to be careful with anything relating to accessing the YouTube account. So Gordon's aware of this uh, and noted that basically IT is now aware of this too. And the bigger problem, even though part of this issue is on PC World parent company's uh, head for doing it wrong. Part of it is also on YouTube, actually a large part, 
where it proves once again that it is incredibly difficult to get in contact with anybody, any human at YouTube to get any help whatsoever. It's very unfortunate because you, you, AdSense, when you watch the ads or whatever before the video or if you have YouTube Premium, that money, we share it with YouTube. So they, they make a lot off of larger channels. Uh, at our channel size, the rev share is enough to employ people at YouTube and you start looking at it like, well, if I only need to talk to someone for 15 minutes once every four years, you'd hope that they could maybe have a human on staff who's able to reply with answers, not just with, I'll escalate it. As Patrick Stone in our office was referring to them, uh, senior apology engineers. So anyway, um, PC World once again, uh, unfortunately acting as a means to demonstrate a communication problem at YouTube. A communication problem in corporate IT, I suppose. It is partly on them, but the biggest part of the issue here really is YouTube and being very difficult to talk to and very inflexible with any kind of change. So hopefully, you know, we forwarded uh, Gordon's email to the people we know at YouTube. It's just that I don't have a lot of faith in the contacts we've worked with fixing this. Um, it does sound like PC World's going to get things back on track. They're talking to people. They've been escalated up the chain, and uh, probably people in this audience will see it and maybe help push it a little further because that's how we got our issue resolved was by people in our audience pushing for it. So anyway, that's the update on PC World. The channel disappeared. Sorry, the channel's really fun. Gordon does awesome work, and you should go check it out when their channel's back online. They're going to need the boost, and I'm sure they'll appreciate having some viewers uh, to celebrate the return to YouTube once it's all resolved. So. Um, that's the news where it is right now. We'll keep you posted on this one. Hopefully, and ho I'm hoping likely, this issue will be resolved by the time our news video goes online. So go ahead and post the content if it's already back up and link to their channel so people can go check it out. All right, next news item, AMD gaming chairs. That's right, AMD's done it. They've broken the wall that Intel has yet to break. Gaming chairs. And we're big fans of gaming chairs here. This feels like a... Concrete L. <laughs> <laughs> so big news here. This time AMD has partnered with Vertigear on a branded version of a Vertigear PL4500 copy paste uh, gaming chair marketing spam. And AMD has had a troubled history in the past with branded products that you sit on. It's eating the chain. Oh, oh. Is that the, the real shock cam, Lewis? But this one probably won't try to kill you, at least not for a few years until something breaks. But for now, it should be good. Uh, the chair is available in a black and red colorway alongside black, white, and red. The chair features a 10-year warrantied steel frame, synthetic leather or PUC leather, and 3D armrests. Now, just so you know, 3D is better than 2D, but 4D is better than 3D and twice as good as 2D. Uh, most of the, we actually don't buy any chairs at this point that aren't 5D because we want to have both the three dimensions of movement, the time movement, and then the astral plane. I don't know, that's the fifth dimension. The chairs are available on the AMD Fan Store for $580. That price is higher than the technically MSRP $550 stock version straight from Vertigear. And there's a sale right now on Vertigears, which brings the regular not AMD version down to $400. That said, we generally prefer actual ergonomic office chairs as we've covered in a previous video and $580 gets you a really long way towards a great chair even if it's something used, although you should probably check it out in person first before you buy it. But uh, that's what AMD is doing. So if you've got a gaming setup cave room thing that is all AMD themed, then now you have a chair to go next to your bike that's hopefully hanging on a wall and not rideable. Up next, rumors about an NVIDIA GPU. Wow, we haven't heard those before. Uh, this is AD102450-A1. It is apparently an exceedingly high power draw, but there's an asterisk there of maybe it's just a test port. Serial leaker copite 7 kimi has struck once more, tweeting about a ridiculously high-powered NVIDIA GPU that he dubs, quote, the Beast. copite 7 kimi claims that the Beast is featuring 18,176 CUDA cores, 48 gigabytes of 24 gigabit per second GDDR6X, and a total board power of 800 watts. But it's possible that this is just the uh, test spec or the maximum spec 
for something like a testing board rather than a production card. And if that's the case, then hopefully it doesn't actually go that high. It's probably being misrepresented if that is the case. So uh, and the, the numbers here are a little bit ridiculous. We can't read too far into this one. It's, it's a bit over the top to be any kind of gaming card with 48 gigabytes of memory. Maybe like maybe a Titan, but that seems ridiculous too. So we're not sure what this would be uh, beyond a test board, maybe a 4090 Ti. Anyway, it's hard to, to take much from this rumor at this point just because there's not much to go off of other than those numbers. Kind of fun to read about, but if this beast exists anywhere outside of a power supply manufacturer's nightmares, it will probably have a monstrous price. So we'll check back on this one. Uh, another leak before we get into the normal news, Ryzen 7 SKUs have been dug up by video cards. Video cards found mention of four Ryzen 7000 CPUs and AMD's own resource library website. The four parts mentioned are the 7600 X, the 7700X this time, the 7900X, and the 7950X. We've seen a couple leaks of names before, but this is really all we have to go off of right now. AMD's already cleaned up whatever leak was in there, and at this point, uh, it's just some CPUs from the 5000 series or the 3000 series, except with the 7 in front, so let's move on. Seagate in the news. Seagate expects to ship 30 plus terabyte hard drives in the middle of 2023. And this was stated during its recent earnings call. Higher capacities are to follow with 50 terabyte drives on the roadmap and slated for some time in 2026. Here's the viewer engagement challenge for the week. Go ahead and in the comments below, post the capacity of the first hard drive you ever used. I promise this is not a security question for an account, at least not one that I've seen, but it'd be a pretty good one. Anyway, post the first capacity you use. We'll see who, uh, who had the uh, in the megabytes for starting capacity on a hard drive, and then you'll w win the engagement challenge. Everyone will vote you up. It'll be very good. So this schedule is on track with Seagate's overall roadmap, which was shared previously during the company's March 2021 virtual analyst event. These higher capacities are being enabled through a technology called Hammer, or heat-assisted magnetic recording. Seagate has done significant research here and development into Hammer since at least 2015. We've talked about it a lot now in the news, and that's when it showed its first working prototypes. The first commercially available Hammer drives were launched in 2019. A Hammer comes with significant technical challenges, such as being able to heat, write, and cool the area being written within less than one nanosecond. Multiple technological changes beyond just Hammer are required to hit even higher capacity targets, with components like the reader and media on the platters planned to be updated as well. All of this change will drive up cost, but rising data density requirements show no signs of stopping in the data center. Up next, Micron ships its first 232-layer NAND flash, which is, as far as we know, the highest count of layers we've seen for NAND. So this is in storage technology news as well, where density is going up for both SSDs and for hard drives. Now, Micron boasts that the new design has the highest aerial density of NAND on the market right now, and they say that it's the highest capacity, and of course, they also say it's the most energy efficient uh, of any Micron NAND to date. The new Flash also features a six-plane design, which is a first for the industry. Previous designs topped out at four planes, and each plane can read independently of the others, to the benefit of overall read speed. Micron claims its 232-layer NAND operates at 2.4 gigabytes per second, which is 50% faster than the company's previous generation of 172-layer offerings. For bandwidth, Micron claims 100% higher writes and over 75% higher reads per die over the previous generation. The new Flash also brings a new low-voltage memory interface called NVLPDDR4, which offers per-bit transfer savings of over 30% compared to previous I.O. interfaces. Micron claims this will benefit mobile and data center applications the most. This 232-layer NAND is also the highest TLC density per square millimeter. Micron notes that it provides 14.6 gigabits per square millimeter, and that density results in one terabit dies, 16 of which can be packaged together to form a two terabyte package measuring 11.5 by 13.5 millimeters. That packaging size is 28% smaller than Micron's previous generation. As for manufacturing, that flash is already in volume production at Micron's Singapore fabrication plant and will initially ship through Crucial's consumer SSD lines, Crucial's owned by Micron with others to follow. Up now, a kind of sad story in the news because it affects a lot of people who are working at the companies in the industry. So uh, there were several layoffs we've heard about from people we know in the industry who work further within the companies that we all talk about every day. Uh, EVGA 
has laid off over 20% of its workforce at this point. ASUS has laid off a significant portion of its workforce and has, from what we understand, in the billions of dollars of inventory just sitting waiting to be sold right now. They're having trouble selling everything that they made. And uh, Corsair also recently, although this was maybe more than a month ago, had a 5% layoff of its workforce. Now, these layoffs are happening at least, I mean, we're not market analysts here, but working in the industry, my viewpoint of this is pretty simple. It's that all the companies scaled up to try and capture demand as much as they could, maybe in an irresponsible way where they acted as if there's growth forever, or they just didn't care that they would have to lay people off at the other end of it when the demand slowed, one or the other. It's really only those two options, uh, irresponsible growth or um, incompetent growth, where you don't think that it's going to turn at some point. And so everybody tooled up in actual tools and in staff to try and ship enough products throughout the uh, early, extremely high demand days where everyone needed systems at home suddenly to do their actual engineering job and not just use the ones at work. And this led to today where it was clearly unsustainable. The industry is very healthy overall, but where it was for a couple years was not sustainable growth. That was like a one-off, really special circumstance growth. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully a one-off event, uh, a, you know, a pandemic. But anyway, our view on it is just that uh, you look at companies like Corsair and Asus and even EVGA, and they all try to expand to all these different segments like chairs and routers, RGB LED routers, things like that. And suddenly the company is looking at it going, we're losing money, what do we do? Let's kill all these segments that we just hired for and just get rid of them before we're too far into it. And the sad part is you lose all those jobs for people who might have left another job for that job that they just lost. So it's really unfortunate. We hear about this every now and then. Normally it's just one company, but this time since it was three uh, different groups of people at these different companies that contacted us, figured we'd mention it in the news that uh, there's a lot of layoffs in the tech industry right now. And um, uh, I mean, <laughs> we're hiring. So uh, certainly I was looking at some of the people I know who've lost their jobs going, I wonder if we can make something work for them. That would be kind of the backwards approach where normally these huge companies like Asus steal people from media outlets to go work for them. What if we're finally in a position to do the opposite? They would never notice uh, Asus that is, but it at least feel like we're getting a one up on, on the companies doing it the opposite way. So I don't know. Anyway, uh, we're hiring at the moment, so we'll, we'll kind of look around, but sad news for people in the industry who had jobs that were affected here. Up next, speaking of EVGA, uh, this is their carbon fiber E1 frame case. EVGA has launched a new carbon fiber frame PC case that it calls the E1. It starts at $1,600. This case was originally teased in a video on the Team EVGA YouTube channel back in January, and the E1's extremely light 2.76 pound construction consists of an all carbon fiber outer frame with a steel cable suspending what looks to be an aluminum motherboard frame and radiator or fan mounts. EVGA's IO comes with a pretty unique set of analog dials that has three of them. And these measure the GPU temperature, the CPU temperature, and then there's another gauge that can measure ambient or water temperature. Now, unfortunately, this third gauge only has a range of minus 30 and uh, positive 50 degrees Celsius, so not super useful. The new case is available, in, well, <laughs> Use, useful for ambient and for water temperature, I guess. I, I'm used to extreme overclocking probes. Anyway, the new case is available in three different SKUs, starting from the lowest price at $1,600, and this is the EVGA E1 Kit 2. It comes with a case and vertical graphics card kit. The middle option is $3,700, and it's called the EVGA E1 Kit 1. This one comes with the case, a vertical kit, RTX 3090 Ti Kingpin card and 1600 watt T2 power supply. And that one is superseded by the highest cost kit, which is $5,000. And it contains all of the previously mentioned items, as well as a PowerLink 52U for the Kingpin card, an EVGA Z690 dark Kingpin board, and a custom Pelican case for transport. This definitely screams, we're not gonna sell a lot of these, but let's at least move some of the stock inventory of 3090 Ti's that we have. And, try and get something back for this bizarre endeavor. It's about the nicest way to phrase it for this case. Uh, it's an interesting looking case. Uh, maybe we'll look at it for review. I don't know. It's the benchmarks would be kind of pointless. It's open air, so uh, it'll just perform baseline. But anyway, the E1 
is clearly intended for a showcase PC for those with very deep pockets. And the extreme cost is because it's a built to order nature. EVDA says it takes three to four weeks to build it and fulfill your order. Um, and that includes, uh, of course, the carbon fiber construction cost is high there as well. And there isn't any real world advantage in computers for carbon fiber, maybe the weight you could argue, but in bikes and cars, it starts to make sense. Hopefully your computer isn't moving at such a speed that it needs to be lightweight though, because then you have other problems. Or uh, maybe the Li Anli train case could use some carbon fiber because then it's a feature. The E1's on EVGA's website if you're tempted to spend as much on a 3090 Ti as you are on a case, but we're not sure if we'll look at it. Up next, speaking of companies expanding in directions that are maybe of questionable responsibility or success, Intel has revealed that its Optane business is now going to be killed. This is seven years after it started the Optane endeavor where it announced a 3D crosspoint underpinning the Optane technology. This new announcement to shut down Optane came quietly during Intel's quarter two of 2022 financial earnings report. And while the report mentions Optane memory specifically, Ian Kotras confirmed via Twitter that Intel will be stopping operations of all divisions. Intel posted its first quarterly loss since 2017, citing inflation, lower sales, and it said geopolitical issues as primary causes. Part of Intel's strategy is to cut out wins of business that are not profitable or not in line with its core business. And as a previous example of this, Intel sold its SSD business to SK Hynix in 2020. This really isn't surprising if we look back because Intel had already previously killed its consumer side of Optane, which was especially pointless. The not consumer side of Optane was kind of interesting, but on consumer, uh, it basically functioned as a cash drive and as SSD density increased, you just didn't need that type of thing anymore if you ever needed it to begin with. So uh, Intel's fabrication partner for 3D Crosspoint, Micron, has already stopped production. They stopped in 2021 for the technology. And Intel reportedly has several years worth of inventory on hand for Optane, which Intel has now just decided to mark down as a $559 million inventory impairment loss. Looking to the future, Intel is pivoting to CXL or Compute Express Link. CXL is a technology that allows cache coherent communication between compute devices and memory. Optane products are still used by certain enterprise customers and Intel says it will continue supporting them for the time being. Up next, Team Group has announced a new M.2 SSD with a vapor chamber for cooling. Uh, we've shown vapor chambers getting made in the past, but typically for CPU or GPU cooling products. This time though, on an SSD, and we haven't seen one here before. Uh, the biggest news here is that Team Group claims that in hot environments like 85 degrees Celsius conditions, the SSD is able to get a 75% time savings result in benchmarks, which is because of the heat reduction for the SSD, for the controller specifically. And that makes this more of maybe an industrial or a shop type of product rather than something you would use in an air conditioned room. The new SSD is called the N74V M80 and it's intended for industrial applications. Team Group's SSD uses TLC NAND. It's 128, 256 or 512 gigabytes for capacity. And it's a PCIe 3.0 by four interface, which is a bit dated at this point for a new product. But Team Group claims that it's at 34, 45 megabytes per second read and 2520 20 megabytes per second write sequentially for the performance. Next in the news is Retbleed, the vulnerability that preys on speculative execution uh, side channels and, and attacks. And this is for Skylake or Zen 1 and 2 CPUs. And we have a quick update regarding patches for Linux. So while mitigations for Retbleed have rolled out for 64-bit Linux at this point for the kernel, the 32-bit kernels remain unpatched, at least as of right now, and uh, vulnerable running on those affected CPUs. So there's a valid reason for this, which is that users shouldn't really be running Skylake 1 or Zen Skylake, rather. Well, I guess there are a lot of versions of Skylake. Skylake, Zen 1 or Zen 2 CPUs with 32-bit uh, kernels. So that's why it hasn't been updated. And Linux kernel developers don't view this as a problem due to the rarity of the combination. And an Intel employee actually is quoted saying the following quote, yeah, so far nobody cared to fix 32-bit. If someone really cares and wants to put the effort in, I suppose I'll review the patches. Up next, Intel has published a document citing a W790 workstation chipset. This would replace the X299 chipsets and it marks the arrival of HEDT back into the market for the first time since basically the 10980XE. 
which was the 18-core CPU. So rumors at this point suggest that uh, it's supposed to be for Intel's upcoming Sapphire Rapids CPUs. That seems obvious at this point. Sapphire Rapids has had a number of leaks and rumors lately, including a Geekbench 5 results for a Xeon Platinum 8480 Plus CPU with 56 cores. It's too early to extract much meaning out of the results like that, with so many variables unknown, but just for fun, we compared it to an 18-core 1090XE in the database. And the last one is Radeon's Ray Tracing Analyzer 1.0. This is some interesting software for developers, especially in gaming, to get ray tracing more widespread and off of uh, purely rasterization. Andy's new tool is called RRA. It's part of the Radeon Developer Tool Suite, and the tool is intended to be an aid to 3D artists and useful for highlighting where optimizations can be made to scenes to remove performance bottlenecks. The tool exposes technical details like how much memory the acceleration structures are using, among other things. One particularly interesting feature is the heat map, which visually shows areas of high ray traversals, which may require attention by the developer. RRA can show BVH memory residency, which helps developers to determine their memory consumption and where savings can be had, like triangle count or instances. And the index view gives a breakdown as a funnel to help visualize uh, unique versus total triangles and other inefficiencies. The tool is available for free on Windows and Linux. And that'll wrap up the news for this week. Thanks for watching. As always, subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersnexus.net to help us out directly. And we'll see you all next time.